This is the Human Action Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome back, everybody, once again to the Human Action Podcast. I'm Jeff Deist, joined by my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy. How are you doing, Bob? I'm doing good, Jeff. Thanks. Well, so this past weekend, I got to go to the Ron Paul Institute Conference in D.C., which was a lot of fun to see Dr. Paul and Colonel uh, Douglas McGregor and some other uh, famous people. Uh, but anyway, I was able to give a talk, which is uh, relates to what's happening in the world today, actually. And it was it, I titled it Inflation, State-Sponsored Terrorism. So, uh, Bob, this idea, this great word, inflationism, which Henry Hazlitt liked to use, by the way, um, it, it actually conjures up a, a, both a monetary and fiscal regime. So sometimes Austrians are accused of being too obsessed with the Fed, mm-hmm. and that we c- consider the central bank the root of all evil. But of course, as I mentioned in this talk, uh, look, on, you know, there's a lot of damage that can be done the, on the fiscal side as well, and Austrians and supply-siders and monetarists and generally free market economists would, would all have critiques of that side of the equation as well. For example, uh, in, over the past couple of years, both the Biden and Trump administrations, both of those presidents signed off on huge congressional stimulus bills in response to COVID that actually put about $7 trillion directly into the economy on the fiscal side. And, and so we don't have to go into any roundabout monetization of debt or QE or treasury buying by the Fed. I mean, just straight, direct money uh, and what in accounting circles we call cash cash, which means cash on the balance sheet. It doesn't mean it's literally physical currency, but, but, but currency or digital, cash cash. And this money went directly to individuals, average people like us, in the form of stimulus checks. It went to businesses in the form of PPP loans, went to state and local governments in the form of bailouts, uh, went to a lot of industries like the airline industry, went to a lot of pet earmark projects, uh, you name it. So this was, again, cash, cash uh, floating around out there. And inflationism is a, a wider term that also encompasses this fiscal side, not just the monetary policy side. And I, th- I just thought it was such a wonderful term that I, I wanted to use it a few times uh, to really, Bob, try to drive home the idea that this is just a hugely destructive policy. And there's, just like when we think of a war or a terrorist event or a natural disaster and the destruction that causes, you know, inflation, as the whole world is seeing right now, can be unbelievably destructive. So that was that was sort of the gist of my talk this weekend. Well, yeah, I think you're right to link you know, like, and I get what you're saying that a lot of times the Austrians they just focus on the central bank and and people you know and then people bring up well the textbook mechanism is wrong and you you Austrians are stuck in the 1950s and there's that whole argument as well but but you're right just the the cultural effect that it has I, I think sometimes people overlook that and as you say too it's also important to know like what is the government doing with the money in terms of you know fiscal policy as well and that you know the thing you just put your finger on that might be part of the explanation as to, you know, why was it that the QE rounds right after the financial crisis in 2008, you know, didn't lead to $5 a gallon gasoline, whereas the stuff that happened more recently did. And I think you're right, probably one component of it was that while the Fed's pumping all this stuff in, the government is literally giving checks to people while telling them to stay home. And so that recipe of restricting output while money is not only being created in terms of aggregates, but is there's direct channels into the hands of people and, you know, hey, go spend this. You know, that's that seems like, okay, so that, that worked at least. And that's that helps explain why, why consumer prices took off so much recently. But but yeah, this issue of the cultural degradation, I don't know if you if you noticed this, but I noticed after the, the 2008 crisis when, you know, there were the bailouts and then just a lot of like TV commercials and, and radio ads to get people interested in, the, you know, like some some car dealership, like, come get your bailout, come down here to, you know, Joe's Auto and we'll give you $600 for your turn in and da, da, da. And it was just, and everyone just got this notion of, you know, hey, the the big guys are getting bailed, you should too. And it, it just really, it seemed like everything was play money and, you know, and, and numbers didn't mean anything anymore. You know, debts didn't mean anything. And I, I just, that can't be good for a society. Yeah, it was actually a fair point back then. If AIG was going to get bailed out, if B of A was going to be forced to buy Countrywide, why shouldn't the little guy get bailed out? But I think part 
of the critique of Austrianism on inflation and money more generally, business cycle theory, is that, and I'm certainly guilty of this, we, we, we want simplicity. We, we want to simplify things. Uh, and, and oftentimes inflation is complex. We have supply and demand. Uh, for example, a, uh, you know, a DVD player back in 1990 cost three or $400, and now they cost 40 bucks. Well, that's because for the most part, streaming has replaced DVDs and nobody really wants one. And, and I'm sure that the technology and the cost to make one as a result has fallen as well. But the labor costs and other things have risen. So, you know, you, you know it's not just the cost. Uh, people just got more uh, productive at, at creating DVD machines. Uh, you know, you could say a pair of Levi's jeans costs uh, about the same as it did back in the 80s, you know, so that's deflationary. So there's there's all kinds of factors. And, and today we're dealing with things like still, you know, huge supply chain, chain disruptions. Uh, we have the effects of war and economic sanctions happening with, with, you know, throughout Europe with regard to the supply of oil and natural gas, which was flowing in greater numbers out of Russia. Uh, we have the effects on food prices from decreased wheat production in the bread basket parts of Ukraine and also uh, more expensive fertilizers since a lot of that production has been shut down or it's unable to get to ports as a result of this dreadful war that's going on. So, you know, I understand people want to say, oh, you, you Austrians just want to say everything's the Fed or even, even uh, I guess, more simplistically, it's just the quantity theory of money and that's not correct. Uh, so, you know, I think it's important that we view inflationism, which is a policy. That is the express policy of the U.S. government on both the fiscal and monetary side. I think we have to view inflationism as a, a broader phenomenon. And oftentimes the question is, is not how not only how much have prices risen, either in real terms or nominally, um, versus the money supply or interest rates or whatever whatever you might be looking at. But, it, it, Bob, it's more like the unseen. In other words, if there hadn't been the monetary and fiscal interventions, what would prices be? So you can right. say, oh, you know, CPI is way under control, Jeff. Up until just a year or two ago, it was you know, way below 2%. And uh, Ben Bernanke and these, excuse me, uh, Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen, her, his predecessor, they were actually trying to make inflation happen because it was so darn low. So you Austrians are all wet. But, the, you know, the, the, what goes unasked and what goes unseen is what would prices have been without all this monetary and fiscal intervention? Maybe a DVD player would be 20 bucks at Walmart instead of 40. I mean, that's the unknown, the unseen. And I think that's why it's always so difficult for us to try to explain um, the alternative because basically Keynesian policies rule the roost. Right. And and you saw that historically, like back when the dollar was tied to gold. So people may know this, that, you know, if you look at consumer prices over like a hundred year stretch, uh, you know, under the, the uh, regime of the classic gold standard, that prices basically stayed the same, but it wasn't that they were the same year to year that what would happen like during a war or some other emergency the, the banks might have legal privileges and be allowed to create more money, you know, more dollars or claims on dollars. And that would make prices go up and, you know, the gold parity would be uh, violated for a bit, but then they would go back on it and price and there would be deflation, you know, both in terms of the supply of money and measured in, in purchasing power of the dollar. Mm -hmm. And so that that's the way in which, again, under the classical gold center, the price stability tended to be, you know, this long run trend. But yeah, there were periods of the, of inflation and then deflation to bring it back. Whereas nowadays, you know, since 71, we, we don't get that. We still get the burst of severe consumer price inflation. And then the Fed gets nervous and kind of takes its foot off the gas, but you don't ever go in reverse. And it's, it was just a you know, matter of the dollar's always getting weaker. You're just not sure by how much in a given mm -hmm. year. And that, that's the uncertainty. So you're right. That, that's an element there. And the other thing, too, is because I've had, I had some Keynesians try to flip it. Like I sort of asked that somewhat tongue in cheek after, uh, you know, a bunch of us, me included, had been warning about severe price inflation following the first burst of QE. And then that didn't happen. There's various reasons for that. And just like the Christina Romer and Jared Bernstein, when they had said when Obama came in and the Obama stimulus package was going to, you know, make unemployment not go up as much. And then unemployment went up higher than they had warned would happen if they did nothing. 
And their excuse was to say, well, the economy was worse than we realized, that actually unemployment would have been 18 percent had it not been for the Obama stimulus. And so then I asked rhetorically, well, why couldn't we say the same thing that, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the QE did cause inflation. Prices are higher. They did go up a lot. It's just, you know, the counterfactual is they would have gone down. And the Keynesian response was to say, well, that's a good thing. You know, in other words, we don't like falling prices right. because people think, oh, the falling right. prices is bad. But even on their own terms, again, it's not everybody saying, paying the same thing. It's, you know, in other words, the way they got that money in to keep the price level from falling was to politically connected people. As you just said a minute ago, people whose homes were underwater, they didn't get any of that, you know, mortgage-backed security bailout money. That was all going to the big banks. So, again, it's um, people who did not directly were not in line getting that new money from the Fed back in 2009, 2010 – they would have benefited from a general fall in prices. And and so they're not helped any. It was, a, it was more of a double whammy that the economy was bad, everybody was panicked, and then other people were getting bailed out and that kept prices from falling. So they didn't at least get the break of at least things are cheaper when I go to the store. They, they got hit you know both ways. Well, isn't that interesting though? There, there's this sickness that our fiscal and monetary policy is always aimed at undoing human nature. So you bring up the 08 crash, and, and we can compare that to the COVID crash, might be self-inflicted, but nonetheless a crash of sorts. In both instances, the, the tendency for the economy and for individuals, of course, it would be hugely deflationary. Because in times of uncertainty, people aren't sure if they're going to have their job. They're not sure if they're, you know, maybe they, they don't drive as much, they don't travel as much, uh, they don't spend as much, they, they increase their cash balances, uh, so all that is deflationary on the price side. And as far as the money supply side, uh, some bad debts get extinguished and written off. So that reduces the amount of, of credit money out there. So those are deflationary things. So we have to have monetary policy and, and fiscal policy kick in to undo this. So that that's not good. Uh, I, I think that's bit, that was very, very harmful in both cases. And so one of the big uh, ways in which inflationism terrorizes us is just the deep uncertainty. Right, we we talk about uncertainty mm-hmm. uh, for savers, for people who are facing retirement, for people who are just you know living close to the bone, not sure if they're going to be able to afford food and gas. I mean, it creates a lot of anxiety and uncertainty because you don't know what dollars are going to be worth in the future. But also on the business end, um, I, I tried to make this point over the weekend: is that when entrepreneurs and businesses face a lot more uncertainty in their in their future economic calculations. They don't know what those dollars they're they're making are are, are going to be worth, uh, you know, six or twelve or or twenty four months from now. They don't know what their supplies are going to cost, six or twelve or twenty four months from now. I mean, that what that does is that tends to put a, a drag on entrepreneurship and and business production. So, you know, when when inflation is rampant. A lot of new wealth that might otherwise have come into the economy because people would be accumulating capital and capital accumulation is then invested into greater productivity. Greater productivity makes, you know, future, uh, makes the future wealthier. When, when inflation is high, capital accumulation uh, is less, you know, happens less. And so we all get poorer down the line. But again, this is all the unseen and our our friends in the financial media can, you know, are always pointing to, well, you know, Ben Bernanke saved us. Uh, you know, Jerome Powell saved us. Yeah, you raised a bunch of good points there. Just to amplify the, the thing you said about saving being bad, like that's, again, that's not like a flippant Austrian throwaway line in case some of the audience doesn't know this, that if you look at the, the Keynesian analysis, for example, take the Obama stimulus package, it wasn't all just deficit spending. There were large, you know, tax cuts in there. And, and you know, temporary. And one of the things that a lot of the Keynesian economists who were analyzing it were they're sort of lamenting, like, yeah, we know you got to put that in there for political reasons. But in terms of stimulus, you know, those tax cuts aren't nearly as effective as direct spending because with this, you know, with the, the tax cuts, a lot of that might just be saved. You know, and so in their book, oh, if you just give people, let them keep more of their money and they just save it, well, that's wasted. The whole point is to get them to go spend. That's that's why we're doing this. You know, that's the problem is people aren't spending enough. Last thing you want. To, and so from an Austrian perspective, of course, that's not correct that, uh, you know, you, you want saving and consumption decisions to be in line with people's underlying preferences, you know, regarding time preference. But certainly 
you don't want to induce people to go consume more, especially in a time of, of belt tightening, right? That the, and so you're right, Jeff, that that's the natural response in a, in a crisis situation when you're not as wealthy as you realize was to cut back and save more in the Austrian framework. That's actually a good thing. And yet in the Keynesian par- you know, framework, they got the paradox of saving, the ostensible paradox of saving, where if everyone tries to save more, it's bad for the community somehow. So mm-hmm. th- there is that element. And that's, again, it's explicit government policy is to try to get people to not save. And so that's partly just shows how perverse that Keynesian framework is. And then on the, you know, the other points you're bringing up, yeah, I know a lot of like institutional money managers. I know a lot of like life insurers and things like that, pension managers. Part of the issue of like why pensions were underfunded and thing is that interest rates were much lower on so-called safe bonds than people had thought when they were making promises to their employees. And so, you know, they're they're in a hard spot there where geez, if if interest, you know, yields on conventional so-called safe bonds are too low, we have to do what's called a search for yield. Like they had to go get into riskier stuff just because, you know, wow, you know, 10 year treasuries aren't giving us anything right now. What are we going to do? And so that, you know, just a, a particular example of the phenomenon you're talking about where in a regime of inflationism, which again, at least in the short term was coupled with much lower interest or, or yields on certain types of bonds that led, led people to make decisions that they normally wouldn't have, mm-hmm. which in the aggregate were not good economically. Well, let's say grandma's got 200 grand to her name. She's 85. She's going to live to 90. And she's making 2% in a CD right now. (laughs) And uh, real CPI is at least nine. Let's just be fair. So she's minus seven every year over those five years. Can she live off? Maybe maybe grandma needs to go buy... um, you know, it needs to get into some sort of uh, elaborate laddering structure. Maybe grandma needs to start shorting. Uh, maybe grandma needs to go buy Tesla or Bitcoin or something, right? Grandma's grandma's being too safe. Right. And, and, so that, and that's a crucial point that in a regime of hard money, uh, you know, where just it, it, it's, it's not foolish. Like if somebody says, you know what, I don't, I want to like postpone consumption now and defer it to the future because I don't have as much information now as I will down that down the road. Uh, you know, and is there a way I can do that without me having to you know pick very specific lines of enterprise that I'm saying, oh yes, this is the thing I want to put my wealth into. And if you just hold ca- actual cash, that's a way you can kind of you know remain very liquid and economically that that doesn't, you know, you're not having your input into making things go into certain lines. Whereas yeah, in a regime where no, you'd be crazy. You can't just put money in a piggy bank. That's nuts. You got to go invest in something, you know, put it in real estate, put it in gold coins. Jeez. But you know, you're going to get killed by inflation. That's forcing people who really should not be making such decisions. Mm -hmm. They feel like they have no choice. And, and, and again, so I think a lot of people just think, well, that's just how reality is. And no, that's how reality is in a regime where you've got, you know, and a currency that the government can debase at will. See, I don't know how we overcome this distinction between an economy is built on production and, and profit and savings and capital accumulation, or an economy is built on consumption. Because once you accept the latter, then inflationism is, is, is necessary. It's constantly necessary, right? I mean, it, it's almost like... We're, t- we're having two different debates because the the Keynesians simply disagree with us as to the goal. Right. Yeah. And it's it is funny. I, I, I know what you mean. And I've had that like I would teach an undergrad class. Well, I mean, look, the, to, I, I, yeah. I, I think a lot of Keynesians think that, look, the goal is to have a pr- prosperous, healthy American people. I'm not, you know, right. well, most of them. Right. I mean, so they wouldn't disagree about that. But but how? But the goal for economists, especially policymakers, is to create constant, at least low grade inflation. Right. Yeah. And it's as we, you know, to, to, for people at home who don't know this, the yeah, it's the when it's funny, and there's sort of like an Orwellian doublespeak involved. That what central bankers and people when they go to the Jackson Hole conference or when they're up there at the podium and they're talking about. Uh, you know, a, a stable currency or, uh, you know, s- s- steady inflation, like they, they mean the dollar constantly loses like 2% of its purchasing power against goods and services year after year. Like to them, you know, that that's what they mean by price stability. Like, the, like that, that's the phrase price stability 
actually doesn't mean prices are stable. It means the rate at which prices increase is very predictable. And mm -hmm. so they, they use the, a lot of these terms that, you know, it's, it's, it's built, it's baked right into the cake. And then, like I say, as a double whammy, it's not that they're doing helicopter drops and, oh yeah, everybody who's got currency right now, we're going to come and just give you 5% more per year. And it's just going to be distributed evenly among dollar holders. That's not how it happens. The new money enters, you know, specific channels and benefits certain groups. And then, you know, everybody else eventually, you know, gets their hands on it down the road after it's gone through the system. So again, it's, it's this worst of both worlds for the average person where prices keep rising and yet their wages, you know, are not keeping up with it the, the way they would in a, in a system where the government didn't have access to the printing press. I say this a lot, but just in case no one's hurt, if the guy down the street uses his laser printer in the basement to crank out hundred dollar bills, I mean, you wouldn't, he couldn't argue that, oh, this is a benefit to the community because I'm making sure we don't have deflation. Everyone gets, there's a sense in which he's personally benefiting. He's somehow siphoning things away from the rest of us. And that's why we don't want the guy down the street counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. That's not helpful. That's antisocial. That logic doesn't change just because the the Fed does it or the Treasury does it. It's the same logic. You know, you might say, well, it's legally sanctioned or whatever. Okay, fine. But in terms of the economic realities, then, you know, there's no getting around right, that right. the people but, connected to the government pipeline, they're benefiting. But because government is legitimate and the guy down the street's a criminal, I mean, there, uh, to be fair, there, there are people who literally think that that seven trillion created by those, those two stimulus bills and put in the economy, that that was just costless. That that was all upside, right? And it was just a beautiful thing, and we should do more of that. But we shouldn't just wait for emergencies. We should do that all the time. There are people who believe that. Yeah, I mean, and that's the the people who are fans of MMT. I think believe it. So it's a little bit of a coy thing where the actual MMT theorists still, you know, occasionally give a a nod right. to they, the fact. That, yeah, we know there's resource constraints. Right, there's resource constraints. But that's to them. That's not ever what's pressing, you because know, in our so world right now. That. We're so far right. away from that right. that that's not a problem. So, so you're right. That a lot of people think that, yeah, had the government not, you know, run those huge stimulus packages or relief efforts, whatever you want to call it, then yeah, like output would have just been that much lower in 2020 mm -hmm. and 2021. And so, yeah, that's there was no opportunity cost for that stuff. That was just encouraging production that otherwise wouldn't have occurred. Not that it, you know, transferred resources from one sector to another. Well, when we talk about the Cantillon effect and new money being distributed across the economy unevenly, I think you bring up an interesting point. If we look back at 08, there were particular entry points for all that new money. Uh, corporate bailouts to big companies like AIG. That's not the average Joe and Jane. Uh, and of course, uh, QE bailouts, recapitalization basically of commercial banks, uh, got uh, trillions of dollars from the Fed, but a lot of that just parked as bank reserves. So, you know, those didn't enter the economy in the same way that if we fast forward to 2020 and 21, those two big stimulus bills, those were a lot more broad. I mean, average mm -hmm. people got those seven, you know, those whatever those checks were. A lot of small businesses got those PPP loans. A lot of big businesses like airlines got bailouts. A lot of small local governments got money. I mean, to me, that was that was a little bit more like a helicopter drop. Oh, right. And I think they had to do that both, you know, just politically, like you're telling people they got to stay home from work. Yeah. They got to eat. You know, you got to do something. You can't just, right. you know, there would have been right. more and the rioting. Rent, the rent moratorium <laughs> was, of course, an, another mm -hmm. a way in which um, the, the new money was steered. Right. And then also, too, I think part of the rationale for that, like there was you know, famously or infamously for the unemployment, you know, when the federal government was supplementing the state's unemployment benefits there, there were plenty of cases with the, with the way the formula worked where people were literally getting paid more mm -hmm. to stay home than if they went mm -hmm. back. And far from being a bug, that was a feature. Like some of the proponents were saying, right, because we don't want, you know, with the coronavirus stuff, we, we, right, we don't want people to feel like to do the right thing in terms of spreading or stopping the spread that to put food on their table, they got to go in and, you know, spread this thing around. So that was, you know, the, the actual purpose, you know, they were deliberately trying to pay people more to, to have them stay home. And, and so that's why they, they had to spread it around more. And again, because yeah, back in 2009 or whatever, the, the fed coming in and buying mortgage backed securities to prop up the MBS market. Say, oh, because you know, we don't want the real estate housing market to collapse. 
a lot of people were just running the numbers and saying, well, you could just go around and at least partially help homeowners mm -hmm. who were underwater on their mortgages and it wouldn't have cost more if the whole point is you're trying to prop up them. Wouldn't that prop up the market? And the Fed officials, you know, they would come up with reasons and, and they weren't wrong. Like to say mm -hmm. in the abstract, isn't that a bad idea to go around and bail out individual people who got behind on their more or who were underwater on their mortgage? Right. That would be a bad policy compared to doing nothing. But compared to <laughs> buying MBS to bail out the investment bankers, then it's not so obvious. And it kind of shows, you know, what, yeah, yeah. what the political priorities were. Well, I think some progressives like Nomi Prince made that point. It would have been better. Why, if we're going to bail people out, why don't we bail out the mortgage payers, not the mortgage holders, right? Um, who tend to be more the Wall Street and investment banking class who tend to have more money. Uh, but, but one interesting thing about that helicopter drop strategy in 2020 and 21 is that I think more Americans this time around understood that, they, I mean, there were fewer goods and services being produced. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a result of COVID, there was a huge pullback uh, uh, on right. the supply side. And, the, and at the same time, a lot of money was entering the economy. So I think that's more tangible or concrete for people who are trying, you know, looking at inflation now from a normie perspective. Right. And I, and I was also glad to see, too, there was a, like a lot of people were, um, you know, just saying, well, geez, they're just giving us some of our own money or, you know, who, who's paying for this? You know, let's, mm -hmm. you, you know, like in other words, take into its logical extreme, like, hey, if the government just started sending everybody $10,000 checks every month, we'd all be rich. Like, I think more and more people were, were realizing, well, that really doesn't make sense. That can't be right. And, uh, and yes, there was something about, you know, that, that period of what was closer to a helicopter drop where I think, yeah, people did get that. And then again, coupled with rising prices, I think some more people than before understood that connection that, yeah, the government just printing money and, and sending checks to everybody that can't really be the path to prosperity. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the degradation, the cultural degradation of inflationism, especially when that veers into hyperinflation. Now, nobody is claiming that we're in a hyperinflationary environment in the United States or that we're going to be necessarily anytime soon. I certainly think it's possible. And I outlined that a little bit in the talk. But even if you just have, let's say, consistent seven, or, you know, low 7% inflation, we're currently above that, the admitted CPI uh, by the federal government, which is probably much higher based on the way they used to calculate it. We've talked about that in the past. But let's just say, you know, the rule of 72 says you divide 72 by the interest rate, it tells you how long it takes something to double. So let's say uh, inflation is running at 7.2%. That means every 10 years, prices will double uh, if that's all inflation is. And so that's not hyperinflation. But nonetheless, I would suspect that most Americans are going to have a hard time seeing their salary or other income double every decade, right? That's, yeah, you know, especially if you're pretty established in your career and not just starting. That's, that's, that's pretty tough for most people. So, uh, you know, what we find, of course, is a really uh, present mentality. In other words, a high time preference mentality. If, if money is going to unravel in front of us, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to save it. And it makes more sense to spend it or at least try to exchange it for something that's going to hold value. So, um, you know, I'm not sure people understand that, uh, you know, just the kind of inflation we experienced in the 70s and 80s and the kind of inflation we're experiencing now, that has pretty profound effects across, you know, cultural and social effects, not just economic effects. Right, ex exactly. And it's, as I said, you know, going back to the bailout mentality that I noticed that it it did seem like if you just played by the rules and you got your wages and you saved for the future and you did that, like that you were being a sucker. Like, wh why would you do that? You know, it, just like the investment banks that got involved in kind of, you know, real risky things during the housing bubble years. W what was the lesson there? Because the, the, their more conservative peers didn't get into all that stuff and you know they weren't earning 30 percent returns you know in 2005 2006 but at least they could say what well, yeah but when the crash comes at least we're going to be left standing and we're going to get all the market share right because these guys are going to go under and no those guys got bailed out mm -hmm. right so all the, you know this mentality of just the fed comes in and, and monetizes everything or you know the greenspan put as they used to call it right it, it's not merely that it, oh it's redistribution and so on, but it just culturally it it makes people feel like they're being suckers. And so that, I think that partly pours into 
you know, there's an increase in shoplifting. I'm sure, you know, many mm-hmm. of the, the oh, listeners yeah. and viewers have seen these viral videos. Of pe- and I, not that this excuses what they're doing, but I can understand, like, say, are you kidding me? I know these guys in suits on Wall Street are bilking us out of billions of yeah. dollars. I'm yeah. going to go in and take something, you know, Walgreens can afford it, you know. So, well, yeah, why wouldn't I go <laughs> grab that? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting um, how it distorts us. I, I was at a bar with a friend of mine a few months back and, you know, we, we ordered another round. It was his turn to buy. And it was something, it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something outrageous. It was like the, the, it was like a, a vodka on the rocks. It was something like 13 bucks or just some, something crazy. I guess it was kind of a fancy schmancy place. And so I was like, whoa, you know, and my friend's just like, you know, what are, what are these $20 bills? What, what am I even giving them? I don't care. Like he was, he was mm-hmm. kind of joking. He was, he was joking, but at the same time, there was a kernel of truth there. Like, you know, I'd just rather have the vodka. I mean, at this point, what are we even exchanging for it? So, you know, when you take that to a, a more of an extreme, as we saw, you know, we've seen several times in, in the 20th century, we're, we're seeing that to an extent right now in, in Turkey and Venezuela. We've seen that in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, uh, we've seen that in um, Argentina. And so in my talk this weekend, I talked a lot about Weimar, Austria, uh, where there was a a pretty famous uh, book written about that period called When Money Dies by Adam Ferguson. And it really goes into a lot of the effects on average people. One of the uh, people mentioned in that book is an Austrian housewife named Anna, Anna Eisenmenger. And, um, he just notes her, but there's actually her entire diary is available on Amazon. And it's really interesting to read about it because when things really start to get inflationary, uh, you know, when people are really, uh, cold and hungry, literally, uh, they were food police to make sure you weren't hoarding in Vienna. Uh, you know, coal was rationed. It was very hard to get firewood. Um, you know, Vienna is a cold place in the winter. And this was not just for the three years of uh, uh, the three, you know, three and a half years of the First World War, the Great War. This this in, in con- continued all the way well into the 1920s, as does uh, this diary. After the uh, Treaty of Saint Germain, I guess in 1919, uh, you know, shrunk the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. I mean, they continued to have all kinds of of real issues, and so her diary, uh, you know, talks about this. It talks about how. Uh, you know, people you thought you knew, uh, your, your own neighborhood, everything becomes dark and shadowy. There's, there's fist fights. There's lines at the butcher shop for scraps. Uh, there's a lot more rape. Um, th- there's a lot more prostitution by, you know, women who were not of that class or however you want to look at it. Uh, she ends up selling a lot of her prized uh, artifacts, her husband's cigars, uh, her husband's watch, you know, it just it just really uh, changes people uh, m- morally and ethically. And of course, we're sitting here in the United States in 2022, and we're all uh, you know well fed and have uh, uh, heat and air conditioning available to us. We still have gasoline available to us. But if what we think might happen in Europe this upcoming winter, I mean, already we're seeing utility bills uh, rising astronomically. For a lot of a lot of businesses across Europe, uh, even right now, California is experiencing rolling blackouts and and uh, lo- and shutdowns of electricity because they're having heat wave uh, here in early September. I mean, you start to feel this uneasiness. Like so many th- the things we take for granted are not as like hot and cold running water and ready electricity and reasonably affordable utilities and plenty of reasonably affordable food at the grocery store. When these things start to get shaky, Bob, man, oh man, I mean that's a that frightens me. Yeah, and it's I, I think Americans did get a taste of this, you know, with the with the price hikes. I mean, just you know, filling up an SUV and and seeing it was one hundred twenty dollars or whatever it was. You know, it's like whoa, how, how is that? Mm-hmm. And and you wonder how you know. Fortunately, my income is good, and you know, I I can afford to do. But I was just saying, like, what people who are just scraping by to make ends meet, like, how could they, you know, when they could start taking the bus or something? I mean, then oh, now you just an extra two hours a day you don't get to spend with your kids or whatever. I mean, it's it, yeah, it's tough. And then two things like just seeing sporadic outages. Uh, my wife is expecting, and you know, we've been going to try to load up on baby formulas for you know some of the listeners mm-hmm. might know this quite well is. 
over the summer. I mean, it was just hit or miss as to whether there was any baby formula on the shelves. And it was like a, a, wow. a vicious spiral where because people knew that that was an issue, that meant when the store did have it, you would clean them out. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like how toilet paper and, and uh, ran out, you know, during the COVID mm-hmm. stuff, because once that got to be a thing that people knew that was an issue, then as soon as they had any that you would you would just buy as much as you want, could. So that type of thing. Yeah, that's I mean, it, it's it's a very precarious balancing act or, you know, thing of civilization. And yeah, well, like I say, the, the problem is I, I think I heard somebody say the uh, words, to the effect that the issue when you see looting the, the crucial step is that first person who decides to smash the store window, because then once it's open and people are coming and going to be the 12th guy to go into the store and right. grab something, that's nothing. Right. And it's, the, tw- you know, the 12th guy may well have not have smashed it himself. Right. Exactly. Right. And so that's kind of the, the, the thing when you see these mass loot, it's, it's just a little bit to push a few people who right. are really just, you know, their wife left them or whatever, and they lost their job or what, and just, you know, I can't well, even afford to drive to work and then boom, and they start it and then it's just a mass. Yeah. And if you go back in that, that doesn't always take the form of uh, crime in the streets. I mean, go back to 2008, 2009. A lot of people just said, you know, I'm just going to stop paying my mortgage. Right. And a lot of people lived in their houses for a year, year and a half, two years before that foreclosure process worked its way around to them because, frankly, the uh, mortgage holders were not uh, super thrilled about marking the market the value of all that mortgage paper they were holding. So, I mean, that is arguably stealing rent or, Mm -hmm. you know, stealing housing from the the actual owner of the house, which at that point was still the mortgage paper holder, the bank. Uh, And that, you know, that doesn't require you to go out in the streets and smash a window. In fact, nobody might know. Your neighbors might not know. But I would certainly argue that that's a form of theft. And so, uh, you know, when we look at what's happening here, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's what's going to happen with Europe. But I do know that this war between Russia and Ukraine is not helping in any way. Right. And it's interrupting the supplies. Then you say the, like, the sanctions. We've talked about this on this podcast earlier episodes, how this, the sanctions... Again, just oh, I know we're 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 mad at Putin, so let's make life miserable for his people, and and they'll know it's coming from us. Like, as, you know, is it like the, the the embargo on Cuba didn't show anything? Like, it's not that people rose up and took out, um, you know, Castro. No, that that's what you do to re, you know rally around the flag. That's if you want to make sure somebody stays in power, then go ahead and you know make the make life miserable for their people and let them know it's you that are, that's doing it. Um, yeah, I. All of this stuff, and for people who don't know, you know, Jeff, what you were saying there, I mean, the prices, the natural gas prices in Europe right now are ridiculous, like how much they've risen over the last few years. And it's not all just because of the Ukraine situation. It, they, it was rising. They were, they were calling it a full-blown energy crisis even before the invasion. Um, mm-hmm. And then this is now just, you know, adding fuel to the fire, no pun intended. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's things like people who have electric vehicles, like in Germany, they just can't drive them because they just to recharge your, it doesn't make any sense. So it's, uh, and you know, things thankfully here presumably won't get as bad just because we've got plentiful natural gas and so on. But yeah, it's, it, things are happening that I would not have thought would be this bad this fast. And as we, as we said, I saw you mentioned this in, in your talk, Jeff, that I had said earlier that as, as mad as people are on social media, when we have relative prosperity, like can you imagine how bad it's going to be, you know, right now with one third of the country hating the guts of the other third and thinking they're truly mm-hmm. evil and that, the, you know, their mm-hmm. leader is satanic. That's not a good recipe if then all of a sudden you have trouble feeding your family like that. It, things are not going to well, be pretty. I think what's coming is price controls and rationing. I mean, if Europe really does go into the kind of energy crisis and maybe even food crisis, let's hope not. Um, that some people are predicting, I don't see how that doesn't affect us in the United States because oil and natural gas can flow around the world. Even Russian oil, Mm so-called, can make its way into countries which are not supposed to be buying Russian oil um, under the sanctions regime. So, I mean, it's going to flow to wherever it commands the highest price. So I don't see, unless the United States radically increases its refining capacity overnight, which it can't do, I mean, just... Just physically, you can't bring new refinery. We're not building any. 
And even if we were, you don't just bring them online with a snap of the fingers. So regardless of how much oil and natural gas we might have in the United States, especially under the ground, shale, whatever it means, you know, the Bakken, um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I have a feeling that this is going to hit us as well. Right. And, you know, if you look at the, the prepper genre stuff on YouTube, like those types of videos, like there's a lot of, you know, credible people, like actual farmers and ranchers and things explaining there's like a, a, a delay here where, mm-hmm. you know, we did, fertilizer mm-hmm. was really expensive. So it's not so much this harvest, but the next one that we're really mm-hmm. going to see these issues and how a lot of these bottlenecks are affecting things. So yeah, it's, I, I think that it's, it's not going to be pretty, you know, going forward and things that in the United States, we're going to see things here that normally it's just stuff you read about in other countries. And, and again, for people like I think I know I was it was shocking me just going into a regular grocery store and just seeing lots of the shelves just bare like that's that's supposed to be, you know, uh, Venezuela. That's not supposed to be mm-hmm. down the street for me. You know, this is this is Walmart for crying out loud. Well, I want to close with the thought experiment because one of the things I argued in my talk was that, hey, don't don't let anybody call you an alarmist. Or, you know, don't be afraid of hyperbole. We have to tell stories and we have to issue a warning. You know, if we believe what we're saying, it's our responsibility to go out there and try to make the case publicly uh, to, to combat inflationism, say this is a bad policy and it's responsible for the mess we're in, um, in, in many ways. So uh, the question I asked at the end of my talk was, let's compare and contrast what happens if we're wrong versus what happens if they're wrong? So if they're wrong, presumably we have some sort of nasty hyperinflationary environment like poor Frau Eisenmenger suffered through for 10 years uh, in Vienna. Now, if we're wrong, I'm not going to argue that that's costless. There are a lot of people saying the kind of things we're saying right now back in 1971 Mm -hmm. when Richard Nixon uh, decoupled the the United States from from gold uh, entirely. In other words, foreign central banks could could no longer redeem uh, dollars for gold. A lot of people were, were sounding the alarm bell. Now, in many ways, there was terrible inflation in the 70s, and that hurt a lot of people. So, you know, some of those alarmists back then were right. But um, if I'm wrong or if we're wrong, okay, there's a cost to that. There's an opportunity cost to that because while you're trying to buy hard assets or land or you're trying to protect yourself against hyperinflation that never comes, you know, in the meantime, your dollars and energy, you're missing out on, let's say, you know, some garden variety uh, Vanguard index fund mm-hmm. tied to the S&P or whatever is going to do great for the next 20 years. And, and you, you know, you alarmist Austrian hyperinflationary types are going to miss out on all that. And you're going to be far poorer than you would have been if you'd have listened to the sane people and invested in that. That, now, you know, so there's the cost. But I would, I would argue that if we're wrong versus if they're wrong are really two different things. And so I just ask people to think about that in, in terms of their perspective. Yeah, I, I've used the same strategy, not, not necessarily in so many words, but yeah, it's just like because the sorts of things I've been saying over the years are, you know, get multiple streams of income going, you know, because you don't want to lose your job and then have to start from scratch doing something like, you know, we want to have things you can ramp up if you need to save more yeah, acquire gold and silver physically in your possession, you know, stuff like that, that you're right. Like the, what's, what would it look like in 10 years if you said, you know, I wish I hadn't listened to that Murphy guy when he was telling Mm -hmm. me that stuff. I mean, like you could have enjoyed more leisure. You could have enjoyed, you know, more consumption earlier on. And, you know, like you say, if, oh, maybe gold didn't perform very well and I could have made more in the S and P or something. Well, you could have bought Moderna stock. (laughs) Right. So you're right. The, The downside, it's not too bad for the types of things we're, we're saying uh, again, just like these this, these prepper videos, and they say things like, "Wait, well, yeah. if we're wrong, okay, then you know, in your shed, you had some mylar bags full of stuff for a while, you and have then a bunch you of canned them. peaches, yeah." And so, yeah, you feel <laughs> foolish or whatever if you showed your neighbors, and okay? Bullets. But yeah, <laughs> lots of bullets. So you go to the range. Well, at any rate, I you know, it, I think it's scary times for America. Are we talking ourselves into this, or or is it real? I would argue that the, the underlying economics aren't good because a fake economy, and I even linked to an Axios article, a fake economy is one that relies on constant either monetary or fiscal stimulus to sort of keep the whole thing going. And it really feels to me like that's where we are in the U.S. today. So we'll link to the speech, and we'll ask people to give it a read. 
and uh, consider for themselves. So all that said, Bob, great to see you. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.